Now it's December the 1th, okay? That means 1, 8, 15, 22. We got four Sundays before Christmas. And there's no way in the world that a pastor can ever say everything he wants to say in one sermon. Some guys try that. They don't understand about saying, uh, probably most of this crowd is going to hang with me through these next few Sundays. Uh, they've decided it's a good idea to go to church, especially during December. And so I like to take advantage of all four of those Sundays and lay some messages on you that point directly to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm under just a little bit of pressure this morning because last night I was at the basketball game, which was a great event, by the way. And uh, I had with me Pastor Lowell Bakke from Bethany Baptist Church in Puyallup, Washington. That's a Baptist General Conference church. His son, Brandon, is a member of the squad. He'll be uh, medical redshirting this year because of an injury, but he's still around. And Lowell came down with his son, Eric, and they spent Thanksgiving holidays here, and they came to our home and had Thanksgiving dinner. We had a wonderful time together, and then they stayed through the game last night after which Lowell and Eric headed for home in Washington. 14 and a half hour drive. He said, I'll be home in time for the Sunday night service. And uh, wouldn't you know that here we are, we've finished regulation time, scores tied. Place is going crazy. We're about to go into this overtime session. And what does Lowell say to me? He said, I want to know, does the conclusion of your sermon tomorrow have as much excitement built into it as the conclusion of this game? I said, you dog. Only a, only a pastor would ask a guy a question like that. But I've, I'll tell you what I've concluded. I've preached a long time to a lot of folks. I've concluded that uh, occasionally... Most often when you go to a service, it rests with you. If you come to a meeting expecting to get something, you usually will. I had some folks send, bless their heart, never get a card like this in all of my life. I've been preaching a long time. 40 plus is a long time. I got a card for the first time from some folks in this church. They said, we are so glad to be here. They've been here about three, four years now. We're so glad to be here and we're thankful for you, and you've never preached a bad sermon. I said, wahoo, I'm framing this one and putting it on the wall, and I saw those folks this morning, they said, no, we really meant that. We couldn't be here to the Thanksgiving Eve service, but we wanted to share that word with you. That's a neat word. I'm smart enough to know I've preached some lousy sermons, but this morning isn't one of them. This morning is one where we need to start that focus right in on what child is this? In Matthew chapter 1, we have a genealogy of Jesus Christ that runs from Abraham down through David and all the way down to Joseph, who was the husband of Mary, not the father of Jesus. Matthew is speaking about a man, a human being, being born without benefit of a human father. What a statement. Never happened before or since. No one else in all of human history was conceived in this manner. And consequently, we need to take a good look at this child because we always tie this child to Easter. If you don't tie Christmas and Easter together, then you're only dealing with a part of the story that you like because it gives you the warm fuzzies. Because when you get to Good Friday, there aren't any warm fuzzies unless you know the Lord who died and know that he will be back again. And as I was studying for this, I came across some information and I thought, this is too good. I, I need to share this with people because there are always some folks that think, I can never make it in this Christian deal because I'm not good enough. I want you to see how wide is the mercy and the grace of God, and he does it in such subtle ways that easily we miss it. 
If I were to tell you to go home and read Matthew chapter 1 every day this week, and that is not the assignment, it's 1 John chapter 4, I'll tell you that later. But if I were to tell you to read this, 98% of you would miss this particular thing I want to lay on you right now. In this genealogy of Jesus, he deals with a bunch of folks that are not righteous. He deals with a bunch of sinners. He lists the name of a bunch of sinners. And amazingly, in this genealogy, the names of some women appear here. They just never did that in these gene genealogies, but somehow there are the names of several women here. You know, I, I just want to tell you gals how things were back when this was written. A Jewish man daily at morning prayer would thank God for three things. He would say, I thank you God that I was not born a Gentile. And then he would say, I thank you God that I was not born a slave. Then he would say, I thank you, God, that I was not born a woman. Contempt for women. They were just part of the mortgage. You need to get on your knees every day, ladies, and thank God that you live in 1991. Things are different today. They've always been different in the mind of God. But society has done some terrible penalizing of women over the centuries. But here God does an amazing thing in inspiring the writing of this passage. In spelling out this genealogy, he names four women in here. And I'll give you just a sketch on these four women. First he names Tamar in verse 3 of Matthew chapter 1. Who is Tamar? You read Genesis 38. You write that down. Read Genesis 38. This was some kind of miserable, low-life, scheming, seducing broad. <laughs> now that's who she was. You read her story. And she was smart. And she dealt with a man who was like most men. He just wanted to get in there and get some action going. And he did. And she did. And you need to read Genesis 38. But when you realize her name is included in the genealogy of Jesus. Secondly, we read the name of Rahab. Rahab's a little better known than Tamar. Rahab was that gal that lived in Jericho. She happened to be a prostitute. And the soldier spies that went in there to spy out the land just happened to run across Rahab. I'm going to tell you something, people. Over the centuries, the soldiers don't change. They find the prostitutes. Always have, always will. Don't get mad at me. Just read the book and read your history books and you understand that's a truie. And they just happened to stumble onto this gal and she found out who they were and she extracted a promise from them. Me and my family are going to be saved when the walls of Jericho fall down. And the responsibility she had when they started marching around was to hang this scarlet rope out down the wall. And when the wall fell down, she and her family were in her place, and those walls didn't fall, and they were all saved. She's in this line. Two for two, that's prostitutes. Thirdly, Ruth is mentioned. Ruth was not a Jew. Everybody thinks that God was so narrow in what he did, and only the Jews got in on the deal. She was out of Moab. That was a different country. That's a different bunch. But she got to be a part of this and is included in this genealogy. And finally, there's this little statement that says, Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, and Solomon's mother was the widow of Uriah. Boy, what a sneaky way to say Bathsheba. Isn't that something? Solomon's mother was the wife of the widow. She was the widow of Uriah. Uriah was this great soldier who was out there fighting while David was home walking around on the roof of the palace one day. And he looked over and saw this lady bathing and he said, la-dee-da, isn't that something? Bring her to the palace. And they brought her to the palace and they jumped in the rack and they had this big time and whoops, there she came up pregnant. And so what does he do? He sends word up to Uriah to come home and spend a little time with his wife. 
thinking if he comes home and spends a little time that he's going to say, oh my, while I was home on that R&R, uh, wouldn't you know? I just read a thing in the paper the other day. They're expecting a huge crop of babies to come out of the return of the troops from Desert Storm. Just kind of the way life works, isn't it? Power goes out, and what do you know? There's a little, you know, and the obstetrician, gynecologist, say, isn't it wonderful? Praise the Lord, business is rolling in. That right, Willie? That right, Paul? Anyhow, I, I just look at those things. And when this happened, and Uriah came home, and he would not go and stay with his wife, then David set up a plan, put it in his hand, wrote that thing out, stuck it in his hand, and said, go back up to the battle. When the general read it, the deal was set things up and tell everybody but Uriah that we're going to suddenly retreat, leave him out there, hang along, the poor fellow get killed, and then I'm home free. Bathsheba was the woman involved with King David. See, I'm not letting King David off the hook. I'm not letting Judah off the hook. I'm just saying it's interesting that out of a culture where women were not honored at all, God took time to say, let me show you how wide is the scope of my love. And not let any one of us in this place say, I am too bad to be touched by the things of God and by the power of the Son of God. That can't happen to me. I'm too bad, you're not. The grace of God is sufficient. But key to finding your way into the grace of God is to understand something about this child, who he was. When we take a look in the scripture, we find that there are some tremendous messengers that come. In Luke chapter 1, we find the angel Gabriel. He came to bring this message to Mary, and he said to Mary, don't be frightened. God has decided to wonderfully bless you. Very soon now, you'll become pregnant and have a baby boy, and you're to name him Jesus. He shall be very great, and shall be called the Son of God. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he shall reign over Israel forever. His kingdom shall never end. This is a 16-year-old kid getting this message from the angel Gabriel, and she said, how can I have a baby? I'm still a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And the power of God shall overshadow you, so the baby born to you will be utterly holy, the Son of God. God's offspring like no other. That's the announcement being made here to Mary. And we look at the 16th chapter of Matthew. And we see Jesus in this situation where he's saying uh, to the disciples, well, what are the people saying? Who are the people saying I am? And they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and some say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And they said, who do you think I am? They've been traveling with Jesus now for some time. Who do you think I am? And Simon Peter answered, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, God has blessed you, Simon, son of Jonah, for my Father in heaven has personally revealed this to you. This is not from any human source. People, when you came to the place, those of you that know the Lord Jesus Christ, when you came to the place of putting your faith in Jesus Christ, it was not because some preacher had pounded a pulpit to smithereens. It was because God himself revealed to you, and suddenly the light went on, and you said, He is the Son of God. He wants to be my Savior. He paid the price. I will get in on this, and I will acknowledge him as my Savior and allow him to come and become the King and the Lord of my life. That was revealed to you by God himself, just as it was to Simon Peter. God in the flesh. We like to use that word, God incarnate. And a lot of people, if you had to say, what does God incarnate mean? They don't know what that means. God in the flesh. Jesus Christ came and took upon himself the form of human flesh. And yet there came teachers along saying, no, no, no. Yes, I'm a believer, but there's no way Jesus could be God because he was a human being. Old John, this is written late in his life. The church has been established. Church has been growing now for many, many years. And old John writes this in 1 John chapter 4. He said there are a lot of false teachers around. 
And the way to find out if their message is from the Holy Spirit is to ask, does it really agree that Jesus Christ, God's Son, actually became man with a human body? If so, then the message is from God. If not, the message is not from God, but from one who is against Christ. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. You're dabbling in new age. Get smart because they fall off the wagon right here. They can't pass this test right here concerning who Jesus Christ is and the fact that he came and took upon himself the form of human flesh. This scripture goes on to say this. Anyone who believes and says that Jesus is the Son of God, that is to put your full faith in him, Jesus is the Son of God, has God living in him, and he is living with God. We know how much God loves us because we have felt his love and because we believe him when he tells us that he loves us dearly. Can you imagine that God Almighty loves us dearly? That's the testimony of the Word of God. When we come to the place where we're ready to embrace that kind of confession that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God and our Savior, then we're beginning to get with the program. That was the testimony of the angel Gabriel. Then I look at Joseph's angel over there in Matthew chapter 1. Here is old Joe. He's wrestling with this thing because they, they'd gone through this, this various period. You know, early on there was engagement. This is truly betrothal here. You remember the old uh, fiddler on the roof, matchmaker, matchmaker? They used to make these matches. Kids five years old. Another family over here got a seven-year-old boy, and they say, our boy's going to marry your girl. That's matchmaker. That's engagement. That is early, early on. Now, you get up the line a ways, and then you get into betrothal. That's where these were. They'd said, yes, this is fine. We're in this one-year period of betrothal prior to marriage without sexual intercourse. And Joe finds out Mary's pregnant. And Joe says, well, this deal is over, but I don't want to make a big public scandal out of it. I just want to dispatch her privately. And as he lay awake thinking about this, he fell into a dream, and the angel stood beside him and said, Joseph, don't hesitate to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit and she'll have a son and you will name him Jesus, meaning Savior, for he'll save his people from their sin. And that account goes on to tell us that when Joe woke up, he said, that's it. And he moved Mary into his house without sexual intercourse until after the birth of Jesus. And when that child arrived, Joseph, it says, named him Jesus. What an incredible guy Joseph was. He listened to the message from the angel. And then I think about the, the angels that showed up with those shepherds over there in Luke chapter 2. Boy, that's a, that's a wonderful story. Here these guys are out there watching their sheep. It's dark. Suddenly there's a light everywhere and there's an angel appeared to them and the landscape was bright with the glory of God and the angel said, always like the way God does these things. Does this big spooky deal and send somebody and say, don't be afraid. God has this incredible sense of humor. Don't be afraid. Yeah, you guys, I scared you to death, didn't I? Don't be afraid. I bring you the most joyful news ever announced and it's for everyone. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born tonight in Bethlehem. That's the message. And they, they wind up with a, a choir showing up singing glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth for all those pleasing him. And the world reaches in there and jerks that little phrase out, peace on earth, peace on earth, peace on earth. And they forget to hook it together to all those that are pleasing him. And we please him by coming to a place of saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we please God Almighty. And that's how there's peace on earth. And you may be in a situation this morning where you ought to be utterly destroyed because of what has happened in your job or in your family or in whatever. But here you are, there's peace in spite of the consternation that you're in, trying to figure out what's going on. There's peace because you're resting in the Lord. That's what God promised to us in the message those angels brought. But they confirm this. Here are three testimonies from three different angels agreeing Jesus is God. And then we see God the Father. 
I love the story of the baptism of Jesus because, you see, we don't hear anything about Jesus from age 12 to age 30 except Luke 2.52 that says he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. That's that great balanced life, physical, mental, social, spiritual. Jesus grew equally in those four areas. He was not a spiritual weirdo. He grew equally in those four areas. And at 30, he went into that ministry, and one of the things he did, and that account is over in Matthew chapter 3, where we read about Jesus going down and saying to John the Baptist, I want you to baptize me here in the River Jordan. And John said, I don't want to do this. It isn't proper. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. And Jesus said, please do it, for I must do all that is right. And so then John baptized him. And after his baptism, as soon as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were open to him. He saw the Spirit of God coming down in the form of a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son, and I'm wonderfully pleased with him. Take the testimony of the three angels, hook to it the testimony of God the Father. And it brings me to one thing. That is to ask you, what's your testimony concerning Jesus Christ? You see, until we come to the place where we are willing to acknowledge him and make our confession the same as that of God Almighty, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and invite him to be our Savior and to cover our sins until we do that with the same kind of gusto that Thomas did, who had said it didn't happen, he hasn't risen from the dead, and I'll not believe it till I see the print of the nails in his hand and ram my hand into that hole in his side where they put that sword. And one day in a meeting, a few days later, Jesus walked through the wall and went over to Thomas and said, here you are, Tom. Put your finger in the holes in my hand. Ram your hand here into this hole in my side. And he fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God. The question this morning is, have you acknowledged this Jesus Christ to be the very Son of God? That Roman soldier that stood in front of the cross when Jesus had died, and above him was that little plaque that said, King of the Jews. He's watched all of the action and all the activity a man saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. A man taking care of his mother. And he made this statement. Surely, he was the Son of God. See, his only problem was he did not anticipate resurrection. Because the statement is, surely he is the Son of God. And the question I have for you today is where are you in your acknowledgement of this person, Jesus Christ, as to who he was, and if you've reached that conclusion that he truly is the Son of God, have you made that confession of your faith in him as your own Savior? You see, to look at what child is this and answer the question, wholeheartedly and make the decision to become a part of the family of God. That's the direction we would push you today. Bow with me as we pray. Would you please, Father, accept our thanks today for the clarity of your word. There are people in this place that do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm certain you get together a crowd of this size and there are those that have not yet come to this Christ. My prayer is that folks would give strong and full consideration. This week in the reading of 1 John chapter 4 daily, that there would be some real turnover in their minds about what this says and does this apply to me and have I embraced this truth that all of heaven acknowledges. And then on earth, down through the centuries, people have trusted this Christ as their very own. I pray for some in this place today who would pull a card out of that rack and would say, I need to talk about accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Help us, Father. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.